All right. Um, so I'm Michael. Um, I wanted to do my presentation in, sort of in a story format. Um, I think people ask me all the time, like, what do you do? And I'm always like, I don't know how to answer that question. I answer it differently every time. Um, but I think one of the things I do the most is just storytelling in different forms. Um, so I'm going to tell a story, and hopefully it'll talk about what I do, and hopefully it'll be relevant to the work that you all are doing as well. Um, before I started doing what I'm doing now, which is working with Brown Environmentalist Media Collective, um, I was a teacher. Uh, I started off as a teacher teaching um, environmental science, environmental studies um, in a nonprofit that worked primarily with students of color. Um, and at this nonprofit, most of it, I had a good amount of like leeway with what I taught as long as like certain concepts were able to get across. So like we talked about like wetland restoration, we talked about like the importance of like you know water quality and all that stuff. Um, but in, in my second year of teaching at this nonprofit, I was able to start an after school program. And in this after school program, um, we would always do like extra trips on the weekends. We go hiking, camping, and stuff. And then. On one of them, I decided to do like a little social experiment, mostly for my own benefit to see kind of what would happen. Um, and I started off, so the theme of the, so I kind of tricked my students. I was like, we're all going to go on a hike. And then I sat them down in front of a quick PowerPoint. And I, <laughs> I was like, I got you, right? Um, it's like, gotcha journalism. Um, and I started with the question, um, what does an environmentalist look like? Um, and with that PowerPoint, it was just pictures of different people. They didn't have their names. Um, and I just went through the slides. And we had a discussion of, like, does this person look like an environmentalist to you? Why or why not? Um, some folks that were on there, like Leonardo DiCaprio was on there. Some of them recognized him. But they were like, oh, yeah, like, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's white. Like, he could fit it. They saw The Revenant. You know, it was like, oh. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen that movie. Um, yeah. I, sorry, I got distracted by that movie for a second in my head. Um, I, showed, I showed a lot of people. But the one that my biggest takeaway is the last, very last picture is I showed a picture of myself in high school. Um, and at that point, like, they knew who I was. They knew like, what I was about. Like, I'd been teaching with them for a while. Um, and I was like, all right, like, does this picture of me in high school, I actually don't have it. I wanted to show it. I couldn't find it. Um, but just picture kind of like I basically look the same. Like, I haven't changed that much. I thank my mom for the jeans, but uh, I haven't changed that much. It was basically like, you know, I look like this. My hair was kind of like a little bit different, but I had a clean fade. You know, I had my hood on. And um, I was like, does this person look like an environmentalist? So like, don't take into account like that you know me. Uh, and then one of my students was like, nah, like, I was like, you don't. And I was like, why? And he's like, you look too ghetto. And I was just like, damn. <laughs> like, I don't know if you all seen this meme, but that was literally me. I was just like, damn. Like, but um, it was a really monumental moment for me because here was a moment, a very honest moment with my students um, that I'm really grateful that I had. Um, but it, it set me on a path of thinking, all right, um, when I took this job, my whole, uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to be an educator was because I wanted to make things relevant to my students. And I always try to see myself in the audience. I always try to think of myself, what I have cared if I was in high school listening to this. Um, so to hear that discrepancy of like, you know, how they saw me now, or how I was, or and basically still the same person. Like, I haven't really changed. Um, there was something about that. Um, and in the work that I've been doing um, following my time as an educator has all revolved around this idea of imagination, or especially like storytelling. Um, so I always say, like, we're in a constant battle um, for our collective imagination, um, especially um, for people of color. So, like, I make the point to enter places sometimes, like, especially places like this, um, I enter with my hood on. And the reason is to break that barrier of what the proper respectable, respectability politics means to, like, enter a room. And I still have a hood on today. Like, if it were colder, I would, I'd be wearing it for the point to make, like, I'm a... UCLA educated, like graduated. I have all these things, but I can enter this space. And this, my being, is a part of this space. Um, so after though, um, when I left that job as a teaching, uh, as an educator, um, or sorry, when I was still in that second year of being an educator, um, there was another critical moment that happened for me. So the nonprofit that I worked at used to host uh, the Goldman Environmental Prize winners. 
Um, in 2015, one of, uh, one of the prize winners was this woman named Berta Cáceres. Um, and in 2016, the second year of uh, my teaching, uh, of that teaching position, I should say, um, she was murdered. Um, so she was an indigenous activist um, in Honduras. And my family comes from Central America, El Salvador. Um, that's where I trace my indigenous roots to. And that was the point that drove it home for me, because here was this discrepancy in how my students saw themselves, how they saw me, how we see each other. And yet, around the world, if you actually paid attention to the news, like the folks who are still paying the price and who are still actively fighting for their environment the most are people of color. Um, this is a picture. Perfect. All right. Um, this is a piece of artwork. This is um, Berta, and this is a piece of artwork that really speaks to me. Those are two hard-hitting points. There is this huge discrepancy in the narrative that my students had heard growing up, and it was a narrative that I heard too growing up. Um, and it's sometimes it's an, like an explicit thing. It's just you grew up, you're in high school, and these are the things that you already intuitively feel like that's not me, or that's not something that I would see myself in. Um, this was the the study that um, that was at least monumental to like my work and framing and having like the evidence to show like all right cool like this is something that I know this is something that I want to teach and then this uh, um, collection of data by the Guardian was just um, evidence to show that the folks who were paying the price the most still were people of color around the world so like we talk, we we often talk about like indigenous land rights here in the United States and it was amazing to see that you know the the battle hasn't really ended like. These are the names for just 2018. So this is this year, and these are the names of folks who have passed away, or who were murdered, I should say, and, um, assassinated for one reason or another. Um, and if you look, like Philippines, Colombia, India, like, so there's a huge discrepancy there. And my work since being an educator has all been about how to figure out how do we get rid of that discrepancy in the narrative, and how do I reclaim these history, or how do I reclaim my history, and how do I help other folks reclaim their histories? Um, what I did um, after those two years, um, about a year ago, I started a platform. Essentially, I'd kind of, I've been working as a photographer mostly, doing some writing, and I wanted to have a platform for these stories that, a lot of the stories that I would share with my students to kind of like, see like, hey, you're a part of this. Like, this is your legacy. Like, don't let like, this image of what like, an environmentalist looks like or what you know, a social justice person looks like, like get in the way. Like, this is your legacy. Um, and I started Brown Environmentalist just as a social media account. It was just an Instagram handle. It wasn't like this big like published page. Like, it was just like a social media thing. And I started posting things. I started posting these stories. I started writing about it. And one of the big stories that kind of got my work out there um, was this um, story of tree huggers. So like, for me, I was like, all right, like, I'm going to go for something that's very like, integral or like, something that's like, really ingrained in our mind. Um, and tree huggers was like a, a concept that to me was like, all right, like when I think of environmentalism or how I always thought of it, I was like tree huggers. And like, does, does anybody want to offer like what that word comes up for them? Like if you think of tree hugger, like who do you see? Like a white hippie, there. I was like, all right, cool. Like, uh, we're on the same page. Yeah, like that's what I thought about. Um, but that was like, that was part of the problem. It's like here's this narrative that we keep hearing and a lot of it is wrong. And it goes back to Berta Caceres. It goes back to the environmental defenders that have been killed. Um, I'll go back to that. Um, but one of my first pieces that got a lot of attention were the original tree huggers. Um, and it was, this con it was the origin story of tree huggers. Um, it traces back to 1700s. Um, it was indigenous Indian women, so women in India, who actually literally embraced the trees and were killed as a result in defending their trees. So here's a history, a really like a beautiful history that shows the resilience in humans and can be applied over and over again of like how protests happen now. But for the most part, like people weren't talking about it. It's like you could think of tree huggers, like you should be thinking about um, these women. And then what popularized the term was um, in the 1970s or early 1970s, um, there was a movement called the Chipko Movement, which is like the embracing movement. And they were inspired by um, the Indian, the Bishnoi women or Indian women who were in um, in the 1700s. And again, in India, they showed up, and this movement essentially got appropriated, right? So if you think of like 1970s, different time from 1700s, like 
stories could be easily got like Western, got easily Westernized, picked up, and then like without taking too much time, like we have the term in our head as tree huggers and however you might see it, like a white hippie. Even though we have like evidence, there's stories, there's accounts, like if you actually like looked into it, the history's there. But for some reason or another, right, it's erased. Um, so my goal with Brown Environmentalist, um, and this is the, the official mission statement that I gave it, or like purpose statement that I gave it. Um, it's a collaborative, long form, multimedia collective working to amplify the experiences, contributions, and leadership of black, indigenous, and people of color in the environment. Um, so a lot of folks sometimes like will just use people of color as a collective thing, but um, in some spaces they also make the point to, or I like to make the point of having black and indigenous in front of it just because of the impact that it has of like not erasing those two first things and putting everybody in people of color because not everybody wants to identify as people of color. Some people are indigenous, some people are black and they want to identify as such and making those points is really important to me. Um, all right, so in that work, um, I've been, um, some of the stuff that I've done since then, um, I wanted to, like alongside the tree huggers, I wanted to start working with folks who are already in this space. And my goal is really just to be like, how do I change this narrative? How do I, um, how do I make it clear that like, we've been out here, we've been doing these things. Um, one of the things that I did was, I created a series called Environmentalism Represented. And it was a portrait and interview series um, that I did at PGM1. Um, which is a conference for people of the global majority in the outdoors, nature, and environment. Um, and it happened in Oakland the second year this time, um, in 2018. And um, I, I took these portraits as a way of like naming and as a way of showing what environmentalism like really looks like, what I think environmentalism really looks like, um, and especially like in the present current. Because sometimes it's hard, like you see the names and it's like, oh, they're in Colombia, they're in India, but then it's like, who are the folks who are doing work in their communities? And it's like, for me, I was like, you know, here's a huge conference filled with like over 250 people who are all like brown, black, indigenous, like, and we're here, we're out here, and we've been out here. Um, which brings me to my, the point of, or the power of naming. Um, a lot of my work is just that, it's like naming. Like, how can I make sure that the folks who haven't been named or who are erased from history are named? Because there's power in saying the name and there's power of uh, presenting the name. Um, the second point that I've, that's really important to, I think, intersectional approaches, which is why we're here, is the, um, what I like to call impacted storytelling. So impacted leadership is making sure you're giving leadership to the folks, or you're putting in leadership the folks who are impacted by an issue. So what I see with impacted storytelling is that it's really important for folks to be able to tell their own story and have the means to do so. So like how in the keynote we just heard of like, you know, stepping aside and like giving people the platform and the tools. Like that's what, that's part of it. It's like impact of storytelling, giving people the means to tell their story. And a lot of it's like stepping aside. Um, and then um, this, I can share this also, but this is something that I've used in, in past um, discussions and like workshops of just like different forms of like what erasure can look like. Because of the reason that my students didn't see me, even like as a current state, like as an environmentalist is because these stories have been erased, right? If they were at the very front, then yeah, it'd be like no problem. Like, oh, obviously, like, you know, you care about them. Or obviously, you can dress exactly how you dress and you care about the environment. But these different forms um, of erasure show up in our lives every day. And um, it's part of the work of like the daily work of like making sure that you are giving space for folks to name their experiences and to tell their stories. Um, one of the campaigns I started real quick, um, which is really important for me to always say, um, was this idea of been outside. Um, so like the concept that like people of color like are not new to the environmental space. They're not new to being outdoors. Like we've literally been outside. Like we've been out here. We've been doing these things. Like it's reflected in history. The tree huggers history like is one like just very clear example. Like makes a lot of sense to people. But we've been outside. Um, these two pictures are in fact uh, my great grandmother on the right, um, and then my grandmother. Um, on the left, um, and they're in El Salvador, like, and they're outside, like, um, and what's funny for me is, like, not until I actually started this campaign, my mom was like, oh, I have pictures of, like, like, our family, like, outside, and I was like, what? Like, even, like, for me, I was like, I had to actually, like, ask the right question to, like, get these two photos. Um, you know what I mean? Like, my mom was like, oh, like, we have those photos. Um, but it's really important. It's like, I see myself, um, 
I see myself in them. I see my, does anybody know who this is, just based off of their portrait, or this painting of them? Uh, Arundhati Roy. Um, so this is a piece of artwork by an artist named Shyama Golden. I highly recommend her work. But um, yeah, my, if there's one takeaway, it's like you can't, in order for uh, like true community engagement, uh, I think you have to have all of these voices. And you have to be giving space. So if you have a platform, step aside. Like the Tree Huggers piece, um, the biggest engagement or biggest platform I got was on the Patagonia blog. Um, and that's because folks like, were like, hey, this is a great story. They stepped aside and they're like, you know, go for it. Like, tell the story, do the thing, and um, like, go for it. Um, this is a picture of the Rights for Climate March um, that just happened like a few weeks ago. Uh, it's um, Dr. Mustafa Ali. Um, and I want to end with a quick quote from a longer piece that I've written before, but um, we are not an isolation, we are a continuation. Um, and I'll say it again, but um, we are not an isolation, we are a continuation. So all of us are not isolated. We're not isolated from our histories, from other people's histories, from each other right now. We're continuations of a longer legacy. So always having that um, be acknowledged is really important in, I think, telling these stories. Yeah, and that's all I got. <laughs>